Okay, I think we're ready to go here. Uh, welcome everybody to this week's CDAR seminar. I'm Lisa Goldberg, CDAR's co-director, and it's my great pleasure to introduce this week's speaker, Zach Feinstein, who is from the School of Business at Stevens Institute of Technology. Uh, and just want to mention that this is in a lot of ways a sister organization to us with a real focus, not just on uh, research and data science and financial economics and stuff, but also with a lot of outreach to industry. And we've we've talked to quite a few uh, of Zach's colleagues as well as Zach, Zach and, and find all kinds of interesting stuff going on. So please uh, explore. Uh, if you like this talk, um, great, and uh, explore further at, at Stevens. Uh, it's a very exciting place. Uh, our topic today is endogenous network valuation adjustment and the systematic term structure in a dynamic internet interbank uh, model. And Zach, I will uh, turn over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Lisa, for that introduction and for having me give this talk. Uh, I just wish could have done this in person, but scheduling and all the all the still kind of complications from COVID uh, kind of kept me from flying out there this time. But hopefully, uh, sometime in the near future, I'm able to visit you in person. Um, so, the title of this talk is quite a mouthful. Uh, basically, I wanted to highlight various pieces of this uh, topic. So the network valuation adjustments, uh, a systemic term structure, and a dynamic interbank model. And academics, we're not usually very uh, pithy. So I just kind of threw all the terms at a title and said, there we go. This is the title of this talk. Um, I do want to mention that this is joint work with Andreas Sojmark uh, at London School of Economics. Um, and at the end, there is uh, a working paper that I'm happy to uh, share with you uh, in case you want to uh, see more of the details. So just to get right into this uh, and starting with the motivation. So if we kind of go to the classical finan uh, finance models, we have the Black Cox uh, framework where we have a single bank that has liabilities L do at some maturity time, capital T, in the future. And then we have assets that evolve over time. Uh, we're going to assume they're following a geometric random walk uh, between time zero and capital T. And then this bank, this institution, will de declare itself to be in default if its assets are valued less than its liabilities. Essentially, if you are uh, a uh, shareholder of this institution, of this bank, and the assets are worth less than the discounted liabilities, you're better off declaring bankruptcy, uh, just canceling out the liabilities and starting fresh. Uh, so this is kind of a very classical uh, default rule, default covenant. Uh, so this is where we wanted to start. Where this gets more complex is we want to move from the isolated bank to an interbank network. So now if we have N banks, where we need to split up the liabilities uh, into who is the counterparty. So we now say the interbank liabilities are LIJ due at, again, that same maturity capital T. So this is LIJ is the liability from bank I to bank J which means on bank J's balance sheet, it has interbank assets of LIJ. And these banks also have some external assets. So what essentially we're doing is we're breaking down this asset value, which was capital A, and we're breaking down these liabilities, capital L. So if we were to draw a very simple balance sheet, on the asset side of this balance sheet, we have external assets, XIT, and interbank assets, which are just the discounted uh, nominal value of these interbank assets, summation over J of LJI. On the liability side of the balance sheet, we have the total liabilities, which are what bank I owes to all of its counterparties. And you'll also notice we have this summation starting at J equals zero. Just from a notational uh, perspective, 
we say bank zero is external. So it's any obligation that's due to someone that is not one of these N banks. So difference between assets and liabilities makes up the capital. So that's exactly what you see in that orange box in the bottom right. Uh, so this is kind of the simplistic balance sheet that we're going to start with. When we talk about interbank networks and financial contagion, the idea is these interbank assets are generally not going to be valued in full. There's going to be some uh, losses either due to defaults, due to write downs, however you want to consider this general idea. The uh, discounted interbank assets go from discounted LJI to PJI, which can be time dependent as well. Uh, so as the interbank assets drop in value, the capital is being eaten up. So kind of going back to this classical Black Cox idea, if your capital is negative, that's when you're going to declare bankruptcy. That's when you're going to declare yourself to be in default, which, of course, when you have a default declared, you're then going to move uh, and it's going to reduce the value of interbank assets for everyone else. So the question that we have is sort of how do we do this valuation? This is this endogenous network valuation adjustment problem where uh, the value of one bank's uh, assets can impact another bank's assets. So you see, we have the kind of time T in this model. We had the random walk or geometric random walk for our assets. So we want to consider how does this change over time? If we're looking at defaults and we're looking at kind of these uh, capital amounts, what the, happens in the future is should matter. There are some recent dynamic models for financial contagion, uh, for financial interbank networks, which take the idea that PJI should just be based on the history. So if you have defaulted, so tau j is your default time. If you've defaulted before the current time, there's just some fixed recovery rate on the liabilities. If you haven't defaulted yet, your as these interbank assets are valued in full. This is a very simplistic setting. And I've used this model as well. So I'm also guilty of this. The idea is this does not link the maturity capital T or worries about future default to the value of the assets today. But if we're really doing this in practice, if you think about any kind of pricing of fixed incomes or pricing of uh, bonds, we're always looking at, well, what's the future default probability? We don't just look at has that bond defaulted yet. So we wanted to take the idea and take the next step, which is we want to mark these interbank assets to account for possible future defaults, not just whether that default has occurred yet or not. So kind of a very simplistic structure of this is instead of looking at just the indicators, have you defaulted yet or not, is look at the indicators at the maturity time. Have you defaulted before maturity or have you survived past maturity? And then we, disc we take the expectation, we take the probability of these default events. So here we have uh, this capital PJ is has bank J defaulted at maturity conditional on the information at time little t. So obviously if bank J has defaulted be time, before time little t, then uh, this is going to be exactly equal to the prior case. It's gonna be, you have the fixed recovery R and everything follows similarly. But if you're defaulting potentially between time little t and time capital T and the maturity time, this is now going to give us a different uh, probability. It's going to allow us to mark things be strictly between uh, the recovery and full nominal value. So this is the idea that we want to take. We want to go in this direction. For the purposes of this talk, we're going to make one simplification. 
we're going to say that there is zero recovery rate in case of default. So we're going to set that capital R equal to zero. If you go to the working paper, uh, which is available on archive, uh, you'll see that we do not make this assumption. All it does is make all the equations much longer and uglier. Uh, it does not affect the mathematics at all. Uh, so just for the sake of putting uh, equations that fit on a slide, I've made the assumption that we set this recovery rate equal to zero. Uh, and this uh, simplification also comes from the paper of Guy and Kapadia uh, from 2010. Uh, so there is this notion, we are taking this assumption from the literature, but if you go to the actual paper, this assumption is not needed. What this assumption does is it makes the uh, capital PJ an even easier form. Instead of having to look at this conditional expectation of these two indicators, this reduces exactly to just the conditional probability of survival. So what's the probability that bank J survives past maturity? And that's being used to update these uh, marking of the interbank assets. I also want to say, if you have questions at any time, please just interrupt me. I am perfectly fine with you doing that. Uh, so you do not need to wait to the end if you have any questions. So this is the general idea that we want to look at. And we want to take this notion of valuing interbank assets, valuing interbank liabilities, and really construct a full equilibrium model from this. So I, I've got a question. Um, so assuming R equals zero in particular says that the recovery is uncorrelated with the probability of default since uh, it's constant. And um, there's literature on the that correlation. Um, are, are you, when you say that uh, it reduces to the case that R equals zero, are you saying that you can deal with them when they're uncorrelated or you can deal with them when they're correlated also? So we take the case where capital R is always a constant. So always between oh, okay. zero and one. Yep. Yeah. okay, thank you. Um, the very trivial cases when capital R equals one, uh, then there's nothing to solve. Everything's always marked in full. Uh, but we can treat the case where capital R is a constant between zero and one. Uh, the simplest of those uh, is R equals zero. So now let's start to build up our actual model, and we're going to consider two cases of this. The first one is where there is a single maturity time. So there's capital T, and we want to look at that problem. The second is where there are multiple maturities. So there are multiple times that these payments need to be made. For this, we're going to build everything on a tree. Uh, this is for computational purposes as well as uh, for mathematical purposes to simplify uh, the mathematics so that we do not need to worry about measurability issues. Uh, so for our general tree, we have a filtered probability space, omega FP, uh, with finite times T0 through TL. These do not need to be regularly spaced, but generally we are going to assume that. And then uh, just in terms of notation, we're going to abuse notation a little bit and use omega sub t sub l to be the atoms uh, at time tl. So these are the nodes in the tree. And then if we wanted to write down what the next, uh, the successor nodes could be, these are the ones that are uh, made up of the subsets of omega tl. Uh, so we can draw this out. We can write down what this tree looks like. Uh, but essentially, the idea is this allows us to mathematically encode our tree. And because we're going to assume things are adapted and nice, any FTL measurable random variable X at a node, we're going to abuse notation. It's just a constant for each of these atoms. Uh, so X of omega TL is just X of omega for any choice of omega in omega TL. Uh, so this, a little bit of abuse of notation, but it makes writing things down much simpler. Uh, generally, for each of the numerical examples we consider, 
we're going to assume the multinomial tree from he uh, paper in 1990, where we have a fixed constant step size, delta t greater than zero. And then for our n bank case, uh, we only have uh, n plus one successor nodes uh, for each node in the tree. This is a uh, nice way to do this because we're growing at a much slower rate than the two to the n uh, kind of simple by bino multivariate binomial tree. Um, so this can be constructed uh, using canonical matrices. We can get a discrete geometric Brownian motion or geometric random walk. Uh, so we can have all of the kind of concepts that we want to use uh, from this multinomial tree. Uh, and that's where we are going to, uh, for each of our numerical examples, going to be generating our trees. So as I said, we're going to consider first the single maturity case and then the multiple maturity case. So for the single maturity model, this is really the structure that we talked about before. We have assets, which are made up of external assets, Xi of t, which is adapted to our filtration, and interbank assets that are fixed uh, LJIs uh, at time, due at time capital T. Liabilities, again, fixed, due at time capital T, uh, summation LIJ, plus these external liabilities as well. So this is really the balance sheet for bank I uh, that we want to consider. We have risk-free rate R, uh, little r, uh, that we use for discounting purposes, uh, but everything kind of in the typical, simple way. And then we need to model our capital. So if we look at the book value, so before we do any kind of the remarking of these interbank assets, the book value of the capital is Xi of t plus the discounted interbank assets minus the discounted liabilities. And these liabilities include interbank and external liabilities. But if we wanted to really look at the realized capitals, we have a joint system between the capital, the probability of solvency, and the default time. So going through this system, and I tried to use kind of colors to make the different uh, variables a little bit clearer. So in blue, we have the capital. So at time for bank I, at time T, in state omega t is the value of the ex its external assets at that time. The discounted liabilities uh, times, or discounted assets times the remarking based on the probability of solvency minus the discounted liabilities, where the probability of solvency is the probability that tau i is greater than capital T, conditional on the information at time t, in node omega t. And the default time is the first time that the capital drops below zero. So we have this joint system between the capital, the probability of solvency, and the default time. This is probably the most important equation that's going to show up uh, in this talk. Uh, so I want to make sure everyone really kind of understands it. Uh, but really, the idea is you cannot look at any one of these pieces independently. And this is why we're calling this an endogenous network valuation adjustment, because ultimately we're having the adjustments because the capital of one bank depends on the uh, probability of solvency for its counterparties. And uh, so that's what makes it kind of a network valuation. And it's endogenous because it depends on itself. There's all these feedback effects uh, in terms of how we're coming up with this network valuation. So we write down this clearing system. And the first question is, is this even a well-defined system? And the answer is yes, there does exist a solution to the system. In fact, there exists maximal and minimal solutions. We use the typical uh, Tarski uh, fixed point theorem for uh, financial uh, contagion models. The idea here is the capital is increasing in the probability of solvency. The probability of solvency is increasing in the default time. And the default time is increasing in the capital. 
So we have kind of, if one of them increases, all the rest increase, so we get a monotonic mapping. And because we're working in this finite probability space, this is still a uh, finite uh, complete lattice that we can work with. This is really the piece where having the lattice, having the finite probability space really was uh, important. I do believe this will generalize, these results will generalize to the general uh, probability space, but you do need to be careful about measurability issues. Uh, so to kind of work around that, we went to the uh, tree model, the uh, this finite probability space so that everything will work analytically. Can I ask a, a question? Uh, so you're, you're assuming that every bank has a non-trivial connection to every other bank or or some not? of the some of the LJIs can be zero. Um, uh -huh. so, so it's just an assumption that the liabilities are deterministic. Uh-huh. Okay, because there's a lot of literature which sounds similar. Maybe you'll tell me it's very different about networks of banks and shocks to them yep. and whether you get contagion. These are, are um, asymptotic results, which I, I'm clear you're not doing here. And in, in that stream of literature, the shape of the network and the way it grows um, has an impact on the results, if I'm not, if I'm remembering correctly. Yes. Yeah, so uh, there's two pieces to that where this differs. Uh, the first is, one, we're not doing the asymptotics. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the second is we're looking at this as a dynamic system. Usually, most of the prior literature uh, is really looking at this problem as you have a static network where the liabilities are due at that time. And how does the clearing and how does the contagion spread at that time? Here, the idea is that the liabilities are due sometime in the future at some maturity right. capital T. And what can happen before we even reach that concluding time? Um, so that's the other piece that's really different uh, between this model and the prior literature. Uh, as I mentioned uh, kind of at the beginning motivation, when there were the models that considered dynamic network models, they always assumed you just said, have you defaulted or not? And that's the level that you really look at remarking assets. Here, okay. we really want the idea of uh, we should be looking towards the future and marking things as we would in typical financial models. Uh -huh. uh, got one more question while I've got you. Does this, to what extent, I think you said you were doing geometric Brownian motion. So now you have formulas for probability of crossing a barrier and so on uh, that are nice and implementable. Are, are you able to do this in, in more general uh, so, settings? So actually, so here in the numerical examples, we use the geometric random walk. In the this existence result, in all the theoretical results, we do not rely on it being that. This is X is just an adapted process to our tree. Mm -hmm. That's the only assumption we need on X. And actually, even with the uh, with the geometric random walk, we do not have analytical solutions. Because of the fixed point nature of this problem, because of how it feeds back uh, through both between banks and through time, so through multiple layers, uh, we were unable to come to any kind of simple analytical structure, even in a two-bank setting. Well, yeah, but that doesn't mean you don't make use of these formulas in your code, which could speed it. If you, if you had to do valuation or analysis of probability of default, you would have that as some embedded loop in the analysis where here you can write down a formula that makes the thing tractable. So so there, there's still a question, but. Yeah, yeah. so we did not, uh, in some of the future things that we've been trying in terms of putting this into a continuous time model, especially with like a geometric Brownian motion, uh, where this becomes much more of a fixed point of option pricing, mm -hmm. uh, 
there we've tried to take advantage of exactly what you're talking about, um, where we tried to take advantage of the fact that we have these options. Uh, for each step, we know closed form solutions and whether that can help us get to uh, get to much simpler equations. Here, we just use this system uh, as written because with the tree, uh, we're able to just compute it in a reasonable amount of time anyway. Got it, thank you. Yep, absolutely. So this was our kind of structural model of the problem. But then we wanted to ask the question, can we actually say anything about the solutions that we find? Uh, in particular, is the solution going to be Markovian? Uh, because that's something, again, going back to kind of the finance, we really would like a Markovian type of solution where it doesn't matter which path we've taken, it just depends where we currently are sitting. And what we found is uh, that if we take the capital, and the probability of solvency and augmented by the external assets and by this process, which we call IOTA, which is just has bank, uh, has the bank defaulted before time L or not, that augmented joint process will be Markovian for the maximal solution. And this maximal solution we can find through a dynamic programming principle. So we have this realize solution of this psi hat problem where it's a fixed point problem where at the terminal time so l equals this calligraphic l that second case we just have the fixed point that we had before where capital is exactly the equation there's no more discounting because we're at the terminal time and uh in the probability of solvency we just say have you defaulted before? That's this diagonal of iota times the indicator, are you defaulting now? Where are you solvent now? So using that, we're able to get our terminal time case. And this is a fixed point at the terminal time, which is just dependent on the past through iota. And then at previous times, we have the capital is computed exactly as we had it on the previous slide. And the probability of solvency is being done uh, just by computing this conditional expectation where we're using psi hat at time t l plus one. So we're moving forward one time step and kind of doing this recursive tower property with our probabilities of solvency. So we have this kind of DPP-like representation for the maximal fixed point. This fixed point operator we assume is going to output the maximal one, because at each time step, we do have Tarski's fixed point. And uh, that representation allows us to prove the Markovianity of these solutions, of this joint process where we assume X is not just adapted, but is Markovian as well. So kind of we start with a Markovian process, it leads us to Markovian outputs. So this is really nice. It gives us nice mathematical structure. Uh, so we can kind of start saying, okay, this becomes more tractable to use analytic or computationally. So let's go to a very simple example just to see what this model does. So we're gonna consider a two bank system where we have the correlated geometric random walks uh, for, for the external assets. Delta T is 0.1, capital T is one. So we have 10 time steps and it's a symmetric system. Bank one owes $1 to bank two, bank two owes $1 to bank one. External obligations, both banks owe one half uh, to external. And from plotting purposes, we're just going to plot the probability of solvency for one of the two banks. It doesn't matter which because these are uh, ultimately symmetric institutions. And I'm going to start with kind of the dashed blue line at the top. This is the case if we just say, let's zero out the interbank obligations. So neither bank, they net their obligations, they owe nothing. So there's no chance of any kind of uh, contagion. 
in theory, this should be a straight line across. The reason that it changes is as we change the correlation rho from negative one to one, the tree values change as well. Uh, so because the tree is being modified, there's slight changes to the probability of default. Uh, so we wanted to show this just to show what amount can be accounted for just from the changes, the small changes in the tree, and what can be accounted for through the contagion. So if we kind of read this plot going across for the blue, uh, for the black line, which is this equilibrium probability of solvency using our model, and this is the maximal probability of solvency. As we go across, we see when we have very negative correlations, there's no probability of contagion. It makes sense if one bank is uh, defaulting, the other bank, due to the negative correlation, is doing really well. Uh, so they are far away from the default boundary, and therefore, even with the losses to their interbank obligate uh, interbank assets, they're still going to stay solvent. But then, once we reach about 0.7, negative 0.75 correlation, there is now this jump downward uh, due to contagion. So now we have the possibility that there are joint uh, effects, that when one bank is being marked down, it causes the other bank uh, to have a higher probability of default and this kind of spirals. And we can see this kind of decreasing as we increase the correlation until we reach about a zero correlation, independent geometric random walks. The reason for kind of the step structure here is exactly that we have a tree. Uh, because of the discrete nature of the model, once one bank kind of hits the default, until some new event is able to some other omega hits, until there's another possible default to happen, the model stays constant. Uh, so if we kind of increase this from delta t is 0.1 to delta t is 0 0.01, for instance, this becomes a smoother curve. Uh, but just curse of dimensionality, this was much quicker to compute uh, with 10 time steps than with more than 10 time steps. Um, the other thing to note is this is not monotonic. Some of the upward jumps we can kind of attribute to what's going on with the tree structure. As you can see, the blue line is not monotonic. But for instance, at about correlation of 0.75, we have a very clear upward jump to the probability of solvency. So what happens is there are some correlations where ultimately this starts to improve. These are still really low probabilities of solvency. We start uh, in the base case without an interbank network at about a 97.5% probability of solvency. And in equilibrium, we're between 60 and 70% probability of solvency. So this is a large effect coming from this uh, coming from this possible contagion. And just to really look at the contagion, if instead of just looking at what's the probability of one bank being solvent or insolvent, we look at what's the probability of having one bank default or both banks default, we can see at the very beginning when correlations are really low, really negative, it's always just going to be one bank defaulting. But as the correlations increase, the probability that one bank defaults and the other one doesn't gets smaller and smaller until we have complete overlapping. That if one defaults, it will always drive the other into default. Or if they're perfectly correlated, they will just happen simultaneously. Uh, so this is just to look at what is uh, how much of this is contagion and how much of it is uh, just one of the banks defaulting and the other is unharmed. So this is the single maturity setting. But as I said, we wanted to also look at the multiple maturity setting. So now we want to be a little bit more careful about the assets and liabilities. So we still have our external assets Xi which we're going to now assume are risky assets. As we said, these are adapted. They're going to change over time. But now we also want to talk about risk-free assets. So the bank could choose 
to reinvest some of their assets in the risk-free asset. In the single maturity case, we basically thought, okay, if all the liabilities are due at maturity, you're just going to stay exactly in your quote unquote optimal portfolio that you started at time zero. And we assume this adapted process is optimized already. But now because there can be some incoming uh, assets uh, through the interbank network, we want to think about, well, what asset is that going to come into? Is that going to be risky or is that going to be risk-free? So we split up assets into risky assets, risk-free assets, and interbank assets, which also can have different maturities. So we have time TK greater than TL. And then we have uh, the liabilities due at time TK as well. So we need to be very careful about all these super and subscripts to make sure everything's being accounted for correctly. But the idea is we have an interbank network at each time. And then at each time, the bank doesn't need to stay in the external risky asset. They can rebalance their assets over time. So the idea is we want to invest alpha I fraction of the liquid assets in the risk-free asset. Simplest case, this alpha is equal to zero. We're always just investing in the risky asset. So this is ba that basically brings us back to the single maturity setting. But we could have that you want to invest risk a portion of your portfolio risk-free. So then the return from time TL to TL plus one is risk-free times alpha I plus whatever the return on the risky is times one minus alpha I, and then subtracting one just so that this is in return. And we're going to assume that this alpha is between zero and one. You can't short the risky asset and you can't borrow more uh, and impact what the liabilities would be. So alpha is always going to be between zero and one. And uh, again, it is adapted and helps us generate what the asset, the external assets will be at time TL plus one. And following the model of Kuznetsov and Verart, if a bank defaults on its liabilities at some maturity, it's also going to be defaulting on all future liabilities as well. So this is really kind of a bankruptcy rule where when you default, you go to bankruptcy court and all of your future liabilities are brought in uh, to be settled at that time. Which means we need to distinguish between two cases, between insolvency, where ultimately you're defaulting because of future liabilities that you may not be able to pay, and illiquidity, where you don't have the cash on hand today to handle your short-term liabilities. So K is going to denote our capital, and V is going to denote our liquidity, going to denote our cash on hand. So the cash available after clearing at time TL is 1 plus R times VI of T L minus 1. So basically, what's our uh, external assets going to be worth after uh, kind of this returns from however we rebalanced our portfolio, plus the summation over liabilities being paid at time L, minus the liabilities you need to pay at time L. Uh, so because of this zero recovery rule, we're only collecting interbank assets if bank J is solvent at time TL, and we start VI of zero at XI of zero. And the realized capital at time TL is the cash available at that time plus the discounted uh, value of the future interbank assets minus the liabilities. So just summing all of this up. Uh, so this kind of gives us the start of what this clearing system is going to look like. So we have the cash available is accumulating over time, but being used to pay down their liabilities at that time. And capital is dependent on the cash available. 
So now our joint clearing system, we have our capital, cash available, probability of solvency, and default time. So capital is exactly what we had before, is the cash available plus uh, the value of the future interbank assets discounted by the probability of solvency. And now this probability of solvency is between TL and TK. It's the probability that you're solvent at different maturity times. And you owe the liabilities, L, I, J, K. Cash available is accumulating over time where some of this is coming due today. So it increases and decreases depending on if you're a net lender or net borrower. Probability of solvency is dependent on both the time TL that this is being measured and time TK uh, that you're seeing if you're solvent. And the default time is when either your capital or your cash go negative. If your cash is negative, it means you're uh, you don't have the asset the assets to pay off the current short term liabilities. If your capital is negative, it means that the shareholders kind of benefit from defaulting early. They can declare bankruptcy and be better off from zeroing out both the assets and liabilities than if they uh, continued in kind of a risk neutral sense. Uh, if you wanted to allow for kind of borrowing against future assets, that really means that we don't need to worry about the cash account, about V. Uh, if we want to really just focus on the short-term liability problem uh, or the short-term liquidity problem, then we can just look at when V is negative. Uh, so we can look at any of these three cases. We decided to look at the minimum of K and V being negative. When one of them goes negative, then a default will occur. So we have this joint system. And again, the question comes up, is this a well-defined system? Before we get to that, we want to talk a little bit about the rebalancing strategies alpha. So we can consider either open loop controls alpha. So it's just predefined how we're going to rebalance. So as we get closer to maturities, Maybe we start moving from risky to risk-free, or it can be closed loop where it depends on the time and also on what the realized capital and cash are at that time. Simplest cases, we invest purely in the risky asset, alpha is equal to zero, or the risk-free asset, alpha is equal to one. We could say we want to uh, take what our incoming liabilities are and we invest all of that in risk-free so long as we're invested in X amount in the risky asset. So kind of what our initial goal portfolio was, was X. And anything beyond that, we want to just put into the risk-free uh, asset. And then the final one that we consider, which we call an optimal constrained uh, rebalancing is where we look at the risk-weighted capital and we say you want to invest as much as possible in the risky asset so long as you're satisfying this kind of risk-weighted asset constraint where uh, you can't necessarily invest entirely in the risky asset because that will make you violate certain capital regulations. So you invest as much as possible and when that uh, when you hit that boundary, you just have to invest the rest in the risk-free asset to satisfy the regulations. So we consider these four different uh, rebalancing strategies in numerics, but we can consider any open or closed loop control of this form, as long as this is adapted process. So then keeping whichever of these is your favorite in mind, we want to look at the existence of this problem. Uh, and what we're able to find, we no longer have Tarski. We no longer have a maximum and minimal clearing solution because due to the uh, rebalancing, due to the multiple maturities, all of this is no longer uh, quite uh, so clearly going to be uh, monotonic. 
But what we can do is construct a DPP representation where at each time point, we take a maximal solution. So it's kind of a locally maximal uh, fixed point. And this follows, the equations get very long, but it follows from the same kind of formulation as we had in the single maturity setting. So we have this DPP representation for this clearing system. And uh, with this, we get a Markovian solution. Again, we need to uh, augment. Now we have our capital, cash, and probability of solvency, which we need to augment by our external risky assets X and by IOTA, by this uh, indicator, whether we are solvent at time TL or not. Uh, so with those augmentations, this joint system is Markovian, and uh, it is an equilibrium solution to this problem. So this does get more complex. If you go to the paper, we spell out exactly what this DPP representation is. Uh, but the idea is it looks very similar to the one in the single maturity setting. Um, so then to kind of finish up a little bit, want to look at a couple of numerical examples. So let's go back to our two bank system. Again, starting with very simple. So two bank system, delta T is 0.1, maturity is time one. And we'll say correlations are 50% between the two uh, banks. And then the system is such that if we sum up all the liabilities and all the interbank assets, this is exactly the same as the uh, earlier example we gave. So what bank one owes to bank two in total is $1. What bank two owes to bank one in total is $1. What bank one owes externally, what bank two owes externally over each maturity time is one half. And then just for this simple example, we split these up randomly. We did a uniform random uh, generation so that the sums are correct. And we wanted to look at what the realized interest rates would be. So we're sitting at time zero. Using the probability of solvency, we can construct what would the interest rate be so that we can find the term structure. And this is a term structure where bank one depends on bank two and bank two depends on bank one. So we have this interplay, this network effect to get a systemic term structure. The first thing we see here is there's no early defaults. Neither bank defaults before time 0.4. Um, this is just due to the initial conditions of this problem. Um, and if you also notice the two banks these term structures are very similar, but there are slight differences. Uh, for instance, if you look kind of at maturity 0.6, bank two is a little bit flatter. Bank one is kind of having this inverted shape already. Uh, so there are slight differences. This is just due to the random generation of the interbank obligations and external obligations differing slightly between the two banks. Then if we want to look at the we're going to look at three of the different rebalancing strategies. So alpha zero, which is the blue line, they're all the same up until maturity 0.5. Um, but alpha zero is where you invest entirely in the risky asset. So we can see that is going to jump up and it kind of stays elevated. We have a higher interest rate that would need to be charged. Alpha L is where once you reach a certain amount of the uh, risky asset, you then invest the surplus into the risk-free. So as expected, this decreases the interest rate that would need to be charged. This decreases the riskiness of the system because ultimately when banks have some risk-free assets, it gives them a buffer to cover uh, some of the contagion. And then the last case, the yellow curve, which is alpha star, this is this optimal subject to capital rate, uh, weighted constraints, which ultimately we're finding is the riskiest of the three settings. The reason for this is the counter cyclical or pro cyclical nature 
of these kind of leverage type constraints. So because this is pro-cyclical, when the bank is hitting towards getting close to the default boundary, they need to be invested entirely in the risk-free asset, which means they have no upward probability. They're really close to default. So if there's any kind of negative effect, they're going to uh, cross into the default case. Whereas if there's an upward swing in the market, they don't get those benefits. So they stay, once they hit close to the boundary, they're gonna stay close to the boundary and ultimately it increases the probability of default or increases the interest rate that would need to be charged. So we're able to kind of capture the pro-cyclical nature of, the, uh, of this regulation and see it in the resulting interest rates. So this is the first example that we wanted to consider. The next, as just kind of a quick case to see what could happen. So again, the two bank system, we want again where uh, kind of they're symmetric, delta T is 0.1, kind of keeping the same level of code. But now we're going to say the interbank assets come due at only three times, at time three, six, and 10, or 0 0.3, 0 0.6, and one. So they don't need to be due at every time point. And the total interbank uh, uh, obligations, L12, does not need to sum up to one, but is now going to sum up to what we're going to call L bar. So we're just going to be something that we can vary uh, so that we can vary the leverage. The external obligations, L10 of L, is 1.6 at time 3, 6, and 10. Uh, so that, again, the total... Uh, external obligations sum up to one half, the same as the prior uh, examples. And as we change L bar, the leverage of these institutions are going to vary. So the leverage would be 1.5 plus L bar. And as we change L bar from zero to one, uh, so that's kind of what this color coding on the right-hand side of this plot is, we see the interest rates being charged are increasing as we increase the leverage, as expected, uh, until we get to a high leverage and it kind of jumps, jumps off the plot. Uh, that jumped up to like, I think like 12, 13% interest. So just to be able to show the bulk of the plot, we kind of cut it off at 5%. But we can see this is not a uh, kind of smooth change as we increase the leverage. There's clear jumps to where having the leverage slightly worse causes a large change in the interest charged. So we can kind of see from this neon green at about like 0.4 uh, or L bar is 0.4 to uh, L bar is 0.5, the kind of yellowish color. Uh, we can see that they are very much discontinuous, that there's a very large jump between these two cases. When we have low leverage, there's very little interest that needs to be charged. These are safe uh, institutions because nothing, uh, there's just very low uh, obligations relative to the assets. So this again was kind of just a quick check on whether this model follows what we would expect it to follow. Kind of higher leverage leads to more risk, leads to higher interest rates. The final case we wanted to consider is now a larger network. So we consider a core peripheral structure. So we have two core banks and 10 peripheral banks with five time steps where the core banks are larger. So their initial assets are $15. The peripheral banks start with $3 of initial external assets. We kind of randomly chose correlations of 0.3. The core banks owe 0.6 to the other core banks at each time, 0.1 to the peripheral banks at each time, and $1 externally. The peripheral banks owe 0.1 to the core, 0 to other peripheral, and 0.2 externally. Um, 
So then we want to consider two scenarios here where we have a low volatility scenario where the core banks have volatility of 0.75 and peripheral have a volatility of 0.5. And apparently my fire alarm is going off. Okay. So I should... We, we really want to see these results, but uh, not at the risk <laughs> of your life. Uh, uh, how, uh, I can go very quickly and then hopefully come back quickly as well, but... Uh, yeah. Um, so just, just to quickly go through the results. Um, so we have a low volatility and high volatility that differ just between the volatilities we are setting for the core banks. So the low volatility system, we have kind of this normal term structure where it's interest rates charged are increasing as we go through time, both for the core banks and the peripheral banks. And then this is low volatility. If we increase the volatility for just the core banks, we end up with an inverted term structure where now the interest rates charged are going to drop as we increase the maturity. Uh, what's ultimately uh, happening here is that essentially there's a very high chance that a bank defaults at time point two at the first time step. But then if it survived that time, it has a very, it's kind of subsequent probabilities of default are dropping. Uh, but what's interesting here is we only change the volatility of the core banks, but through the contagion, the peripheral banks go from having interest rates that range from zero to 4% to the inverted sh shape where they range from 50% or 15% to 50%. So we get this inverted structure for both core and peripheral banks, where in kind of the financial literature, we usually think of inverted yield curves, inverted term structures as being the riskier setting. So this was, we just wanted to try a core peripheral structure since it's a more realistic uh, network structure. And this was the first examples that we tried. And it gave us these really nice numerical results where we move from a normal uh, term structure to an inverted term structure. Uh, and this, again, is just happening through the contagion because all we're changing between these two pictures is the volatility of the core banks, not the volatility of the peripheral banks. Uh, so with that, I'd like to uh, finish up the name, the title of the paper, which is on archive is the final citation on this slide. Um, and I'd like to thank you all for your time uh, and for uh, listening. Well, thank you. Uh, is everything okay? I think so. Uh, well, that's good. Uh, I probably should head out soon. <laughs> Okay, well, let, let me not keep you, but thank you for a beautiful and masterful talk, uh, managing a lot of complex uh, mathematics in the service of uh, clean ideas. So really, really great. We can post your uh, paper on CDAR or link to it, if, if that would be okay, in the slides yeah, and the recording. Yep. And please, if anyone has any questions, I'm sorry, I probably need to run out of the building. Um, All right, you run out of the but, building. Uh, if Thank you. Have you. Any questions, please send me an email um, and I'd be happy to answer. Okay, well, uh, stay safe. Uh, thank you. And thank you again uh, for uh, the audience uh, who is not in a burning building uh, next week. Um, at this time, we will have an in-person seminar, uh, Jerry Garvey, with something completely different, Industry Winners and Losers in a Low-Carbon Economy, a Structural Model. Uh, that talk will be available um, via Zoom, but if you can make it in person if you're in the Bay Area, I'd love, to, love it if, you, if you'd come out. So I uh, hope to see many of you then. And if you do have questions for Zach, uh, 
look up his email address and write to him or, or write to us uh, to Huda or to Sang or to me and, and we'll uh, get you in touch. Um, have a good week, everyone.